Hi everyone, in this video I want to show you how you can use light nodes to make some really really cool effects in Blender. Now using nodes with lights is something that tends to go under the radar with Blender quite a lot and I'm not sure why because you can get some amazing looking results with them. So just for example, two demonstrations I'm going to show you in this video are this environment with this shadowy water effect being projected onto the surface. That effect is done by using a single spotlight with no textures whatsoever, it's all done with procedural nodes. And then the second demonstration, which I think is a lot more exciting, is this really cool looking wormhole effect. Now I'm going to do things a bit differently to how I usually do them. Before we get into the main lesson, I'm going to give you a very quick and condensed, quite intense, short breakdown of the demos and the technique. So that means that for people that don't make it through the entire video, you get the general gist of how everything was made. Also, before we get into that, I do want to recommend Kev Binge's video on a wormhole effect. I think that was a very cool video as well. But it's not using the same technique, but I think it's another very cool way of getting a wormhole effect. All right, so let's get into the breakdown. Okay, so what you need to do is enable the use nodes on any light in a cycles scene. And that will allow us to use the shader editor window to create any kind of pattern that we can project with the light. So here's a water shadowing effect. And then as you can see here, I'm using a spotlight to project that effect onto a very simple environment. Then I thought, hey, what would happen if we put a point light with those same nodes inside of a cylinder and then used a camera to look down the cylinder and it needs to be collapsed at the end. And I thought, wow, that looked really cool. That looks kind of like a wormhole. So let's do something with that. Then I used a curve to animate the shape of the cylinder. But of course, the light needs to be attached to the end handle, but you can't just animate like the end of a curve normally. So you need to attach that to another hook object, which you then animate. And then I thought, hey, let's try experimenting with interior surface effects for the inside of the cylinder. So here's an example of that. And you can see that a lot of the values are driven by drivers, especially the hue values for getting color variation. And then in the end, I did a higher resolution rendering with more samples, and this is the lovely final result. So that's a very quick breakdown of what I'm about to tell you in more detail now. Okay, so now it's time for the lesson. Things are gonna get a bit slower now. So I've got Blender open here and I've got a file that I've kind of prepared earlier that's got that same watery effect going on. But I figure I might as well hide these because we're gonna take a look at this from the ground up. So in this scene, I don't have any background lighting, no HDRIs or anything like that. I'm gonna make a new light. I'm gonna choose a spotlight because it's the easiest one to show how the kind of coordinates work. So I'm gonna increase the strength of this to something quite strong so we can get a very clear image of what we're looking at. And then I'm gonna go down into the nodes section here and click use nodes. So what this does is it lets us modify what's coming out of the light using the shader editor. And it's the exact same editor that you would use for making materials. So one thing you might notice if you've been using the shader editor before is that instead of saying material output, it will say light output, which makes a lot of sense. And there's only one shader attached to it, which is the emission shader. So we can of course change the values of this and change the color. But when you're editing the light notes like this, it doesn't really make much sense using any color data inside of these because you can override the color on the right here in the regular light settings. So if you set that to blue and that to orange, then you're going to get some you know, weird other color, for example. OK, well, how do you project something through the light? Well, for this, we need to consider texture coordinates. If you've seen any of my other videos before about procedural materials and things, you know that the texture coordinate node is very powerful and very handy because put simply, we can use it to tell Blender how to project or how to wrap something around an object. When we're using procedural materials, I like to use either the object or the generator texture coordinate data because that seems to get good coverage around complex objects. When I've done an emissive material demonstration in the past to show how you can get a gradient of colors across the screen, I've used the camera texture coordinates because that takes into consideration the position and the rotation of the camera so we can make visuals change in response to where the camera is facing. But when it comes to the spotlight, we want to use normal. And the reason we want to use this is because if you know what a normal is, it's like the direction that something is facing, essentially. If you think about face normals around a mesh, the normal of a face is usually pointing directly outwards from that face. And with spotlights, it makes sense that the normal direction is pointing straight down the spotlight. So if we plug this normal value into this color input of the emission, something interesting happens. We can essentially visualize our coordinates. And you might think, well, why is it this color? Well, texture coordinates, which are essentially vectors, are just containers or lists of numbers. So if you think about a three-dimensional vector that has like an X, Y, and a Z value, then that's not that different from an RGB value for color. So you can convert vector data into color data. And we can use the term convert quite loosely because you don't really need to change the numbers much. You can just use them in different contexts. So being able to see these different colors here on this cross section, where we have our zero point in the middle, this shows us that we are now able to produce project some kind of texture down through the light. If we use something like the object or generated coordinates, we're either only going to get one color or we're going to get nothing at all. So normal is really the only one that's appropriate for the spotlight. Now we could put an image texture node here and that would work fine if we had like a transparent PNG of some leaves and we wanted to have like leaves shadowing over an environment. Then you could put texture in and use that. But we're going to work with procedural things now. So I'm going to make a Voronoi 
extra node. I'm going to plug in the normal vector into the vector input of this. And I'm going to plug the uh, distance into the color output of the emission. So we can now see quite a blurry version of the Voronoi texture. But it is quite blurry. And what can we do about this? Well, let's add a color ramp. Good old trusty color ramp. And we can tighten these a bit. Now, usually when we do this, we get some very harsh circles, but you'll notice that it's still quite blurry in the light. And the reason for this is because we have some extra parameters on the right that control the light dispersal, if that's the right term. So if you check radius here, because it's on 0.25, if we turn this all the way down, we get a much sharper image. And we can tighten these up even more, and then maybe I can increase the scale. So now we've got a bunch of dots going around. There's a little tip to know as well, if you didn't know this about spotlights, and this could come in handy. If you look below the main gizmo here, you can see this small arrow coming out with this yellow dot underneath. If you grab this, then whatever you're hovering over in your scene, the light will point towards. So it's a very good way of targeting a light at a specific part of the scene or a specific object. And you can see that as we're moving it around this surface, our procedural texture is being stretched. Now that might not sound particularly significant, but that's going to come in handy later. Now you're perfectly welcome to mess around and do all kinds of funky things with, you know, these nodes. There are so many different effects that you can make with them. But I'm going to fast forward a bit now to the demonstration that I prepared earlier. In the process of preparing this video, I was playing around with all different types of node combinations to try and figure out a kind of watery effect and how it would look. So I came up with all different combinations of things to experiment with, and they didn't really look great to start with. I could just get the sense that there was a motion there, but not what I wanted. Now, the way that we can get this kind of moving or simulated effect of things changing is by using the W value on a generated noise texture, in this case, the Voronoi. This W value is essentially the seed value, but I think there's a bit of a debate whether that's an appropriate term for it. And the only reason you get this is by setting the dimensions value to 4D, so four dimensional. Now, the reason my field is purple is because I have drivers controlling this value, but I'm going to right click and delete the driver. So if you didn't know, there is a way you can make drivers by typing straight into the field. So for example, if I type hashtag frame, it's going to set the number to the frame number. So as we play the animation, that value is going to match the frame number and consequently change what's happening on the screen. And of course, you can do mathematical stuff in this as well. So for example, if I did hashtag frame divided by 200, for example, then it's going to divide the value and in this case, things are going to move much slower. You can also use this technique to do looping for motion graphics. So for example, you can do something like hashtag frame times pi divided by 180 to do like a kind of circular looping animation. So anyway, moving on, I kept trying until I got something I was a lot more comfortable with. So let me expand the nodes here. This effect is made up of a regular Voronoi texture, but it's split into three different ranges. One for the front, which is these kind of main highlight elements. One for the bleed, which is for the slightly gray areas around it. And then one for the fill, which is not active here, but if I turn up that value, you can see how it fills in the gaps in between, but we don't need that particularly high. And again, the W is animated. So if we play this, you can see it's got this kind of watery caustic reflection looking type effect going on. Charon from Just 3D Things gave me this tip about adding distortion as well, saying that if you pass a vector for a noise texture and then use the linear light mix mode on the coordinates before it gets to the main generated Voronoi texture, then you can get some extra distortion going which I thought was quite cool. So there's lots of procedural control available in this. I should also say here that all of these demo files will be available on my Gumroad for about $1. I would make it free, but apparently YouTube does not like it when I send people off of the platform. Anyway, we're going to move over to the corridor demonstration. So here we have my corridor, and you know how I like my sci-fi and interior architecture work. But this is just a quick demonstration to show how you can use that technique in an actual art piece. So it's too noisy for me to play here, but I can show you the demonstration on the screen now that I've rendered out. And you can see that using those procedural nodes, there's a spotlight above and it's projecting that effect down onto the environment. On the floor, you'll notice that it's a very flat pattern. And then on the walls, you'll notice that it's stretched out. And that's something that I think is really cool because it's more realistic in a way. It'd be very difficult to achieve that exact effect using just the shader material nodes. So there's a lot of unique power behind this effect. The only difficulty here is I'm not sure if there's a way to get that projection of the effect going across a rectangular surface, going all the way across, which is what this ceiling would be, which is why I've broken it up with these extra objects. Because otherwise, I would just have a bunch of spotlights being placed all the way along, and you would technically be able to see the cones of the effect as the pattern is being projected out across the walls. But okay, that's just a quick demonstration. Now I think we should move on to the exciting one, which is the wormhole. So on the surface, the clay render looks very boring, but if we go into the rendered mode, we can see that there's a lot going on. As we move through the animation, the color changes, the shape of the tunnel changes, and the intensity of the light kind of bouncing off of things changes as well. But realistically, this didn't take too long to set up. See, the way it was done was by taking those exact nodes from before, 
that watery effect. And you can see that here, and it's just been put into a point light instead of a spotlight. And this means that the effect is going to be projected out from all directions from the light. And then it was hidden inside of this tube, this kind of cylindrical tube that had the ends collapsed together. Now this tube needed to have enough geometry because I wanted to modify it using a curve. And would you believe it's actually a little bit tricky getting that exact mesh shape? And I'll explain to you why. If I make a cylinder now, give it 64 vertices, let's move that on the x-axis, let's drag this along. Right, so I'm going to select two ends here inset them with I. Then I have the loop tools add-on enabled, which comes prepackaged with Blender. So you can enable that from the edit user preferences. But if I right click and go loop tools bridge, it's going to make a hole in between the object. Now, if I go to vertex selection, I've got all of these inner ones selected. So I could either remove those or remove the outer rings. It doesn't really matter. It's up to you. Just as so long as we have one tunnel going on. Now to get more geometry, I would press control R and then scroll the mouse forward and then click a couple of times to add those loops. But to collapse the cylinder, I would select all of the ring of one end here. So just to make a note there, I held Alt and then left clicked on an edge in between. That's a quick way to get the loop. And if I press X and then collapse edges and faces, it brings them all to a point. But the thing is, if you do this, you can no longer add those edge loops. So you need to do those loops before you collapse the end. So if I added those loops there, you think, okay, well now we can collapse the end. But then if you do this, then it just brings it down to a point like that right at the end, which is not exactly what we want. So one little trick we can do is we can enable proportional editing with O and then press S to scale down the end. And we can scroll forward and backwards to change the influence of this. So we can get the point going quite small, maybe even drag it out a bit longer if we wanted. And then once we're kind of happy with that, we can disable the proportional editing scale this down, bring it out, and then maybe we can collapse it, you know, afterwards like that. And you can spend a while getting this exactly how you want it as well. That's just a general gist of how you'd make a shape with having all of those loops having collapsed at the end as well. I spent a little bit longer, obviously, on this one trying to get the shape right and having the point light exactly nestled in right at the end there. And you'd be surprised how much of an effect the shape of this end has when you're looking down the tube at the final render because you can get this kind of weird effect going on. It might look good, it might look bad. It depends how the light is reflecting off of that end point. So when I put the light in there for the first time, what I'm showing you on the screen now is a test render I did where that effect was going on. So we're just looking down a straight tunnel with the point light with that same watery effect going on. So to actually animate the tunnel, well, there's all different ways you could do it. You could use an armature if you like, you could use shape keys, but I used a curve modifier. So first of all, I had to make a curve, which you can see here. And obviously the reason why the mesh is moving when I move this is because we have the modifier active on the object, as you can see here. But it was quite simple. I just press shift A and then made a curve. I made a path. And you can see I've got a few handles here, but the one at the end is the important one because as we move that, that's going to move the direction of the tunnel. When you apply a curve modifier to a mesh, you need to make sure that you select the curve object there in your options. You may also notice that the object is kind of misaligned from the curve. So you might need to move it afterwards to get it kind of in line line. Notice that when I go into edit mode, the entire object is offset slightly, but you just need to do a bit of playing around and getting it into a right spot where you feel happy with it. Now, when the end of the tunnel is moving, when it's been connected like this, if we did not make the point light a child of the end of that curve, then it's going to move the tunnel away from the light. So we're just going to be seeing black because there's no light source inside the tunnel. So we need to make that point light a child of the end handle of the curve. So I'm just going to undo that now. So I'll make it no longer a child of the curve. The way we do this is a little bit tedious, but it's perfectly fine once you know how to do it. I'm going to move these back in line just to make this a bit easier. Okay, so I'm just going to hide that hook object. All right, so we have the point light here and the curve object here. It might be a bit difficult to see on the screen because it's just a finiola line, but it's here. So if we want to make the point light a child of the curve object, we need to select the point light first and then shift click the curve and then go into edit mode and then select the end handle, which I have here. And then the point light is going to be made a child of this handle point in relation to where it is. So if you wanted the light to be exactly on the handle, you'd have to move the light to the handle. But where it is now is fine, having it a little bit offset. So with that handle selected, we're going to press Control P and then make a vertex parent. And you'll notice in the outliner, the light has now been made a child of the path. So now when we move the path, the light moves with it. That's the important point. So with the curve modifier manipulating the mesh and with the point light being a child of the end handle, we can now move our wormhole tunnel and keep the light on the inside. But just don't move out too far because obviously if you move the handle out of the object, then the light's gonna go with it. So try and keep it within like a reasonable radius of the original shape. Okay, but here's the thing. You can't animate the position of a curve handle. 
you'll notice that I've got auto keying enabled down here. And if I go to try and keyframe the position of the handle, we can't do it. So how do we animate a curve handle moving? Well, the answer is if you have the curve handle selected, you can press control H and then press hook to new object and it will make a new empty. So if we click on this in object mode, we can now move that around and it will move the handle. So then you can animate the position of that hook object. Now I probably shouldn't have done that because I already had a hook object on that, but you know, just for demonstration, let me reset the file. Anyway, so what that means is we can choose my wormhole hook object here. And if I rotate that around from this camera perspective, we can see that the tunnel is changing direction. So if we do that with all the effects active, you can see I can move the tunnel to the left here and we can see it's swooshing all the way over there. We can straighten it up and we can look straight down the barrel of the gun, so to speak. I can move it down so we can animate the changing position of this over time. Okay, but what about these beautiful streak effects that are going along the side of the tunnel? Well, I had to take some creative liberties. It wasn't all done with just lights. If we choose this tunnel object here, we can see the actual material for it. To get these streaks, what I'm doing is I'm taking the normal vector and I'm stretching it out along the Y axis, as you can see down here. And then we can take that value and we can pass it through a Voronoi texture. Now Voronoi is really useful for getting like dots using the F1 mode. So you can get lots of small circles for things like stars and whatever kind of effect you like. But when we're stretching out values like this, we can take that dot and stretch it into a long line or streak. So that's how you make the actual streaks, but how do you get them to move? Well, as you can see, I put a driver on the Z value for the mapping here for the location. And what this does is over time, it makes it look like the streaks are moving past. The rest is mostly just for color and combining the shaders. If I added the streaks straight to the principled BSDF shader, then they would appear too dark. And if I added them to the emission value there, then there would be too much light flooding the scene. So instead I wanted to present them with a glossy BSDF shader. And then I combine that using the actual value of the streaks as the factor input. And of course we can control these values. So if I widen this ramp here, then we can get way more streaks going on. It's like the rainbow bridge. That's the good thing about having all of this procedural control is that you can really just change the look in an instant. And of course, because I thought having the color change over time for both the streaks and the tunnel lighting made it look much cooler, then I've added drivers to each of the hue values here. So then it's just a matter of playing it out and maybe rendering your result when you're happy with it. So yeah, as you can tell, there's a lot of potential with light nodes and there's a lot of things you can do with it that I don't think people realize. And there's actually a lot of really common applications for it that I haven't showed you in this video. One of them, as I mentioned earlier, would be say you had like an external architectural visualization scene and you wanted some like tree shadowing going across an object. You don't need to place a whole 3D tree just to get those shadows. If you had a good texture with an alpha value, you could put that into an image texture node and then just present that with a light, like a spotlight or something. But it all depends on your specific scene and how you want to set up the lighting. Now, like I said, these demos are available on my Gumroad for one dollar if you want to go and grab them. Hopefully you've learned something interesting here and feel free to show me any results that you make if you give this a try for yourself. So thanks for watching everyone. Consider signing up to my Patreon to support my work and get your name at the end of videos. You can also join our Discord server to take part in art challenges and get behind the scenes previews. And of course, feel free to check out my other videos. We're approaching 100,000 now, which is amazing, although my sub growth has slowed down recently, but I really love what I get to do and I will continue to make cool content and resources for you so long as you keep watching and enjoying the resources. So thanks for watching everyone. Stay safe and I will see you next time.